About a year ago, I made a very similar video. However, just like you, my skills, my style, how I like to shoot develop over time. So today I'm giving you an update as to how I set up my camera for street photography, what settings I use, what buttons I use, in the hopes that it will teach you something new. And if you have your own system already in place, you might find a new hack or a new trick or something new to implement into your own workflow going forwards. Of course, this video is heavily biased towards the Fujifilm X-T4. However, in my experience, I found that 90% of everything I'm going to discuss with regards to button assignments, things like that, will carry over to other Fuji cameras. However, the main principle of this video, which is the settings for street photography, they carry over to regardless of what camera you use. So even if you're on a Nikon, a Sony or whatever, do still watch because you might learn something new. One very important thing to remember though is the settings and the methods I'm going to talk about are not some gold standard. It's just what works for me and what I've developed over time. Everyone has their own way of taking photos. Fundamentally, there's no right or wrong way when it comes to photo settings. You just have to experiment and see what you like and what gives you the results that you want. Oh, and lastly, these are settings for mainly daylight photography, maybe a bit of blue hour, but certainly not nighttime photography. When it comes to nighttime, I would rather be in a pub, at home watching a movie, or asleep not taking photos. A very, very quick break just to let you know that this video is sponsored by myself. My new Zine Edition 2 has just been released. If you do want to grab a copy and support me, links in the description. I'm not going to plug it any more than that. Thank you if you do check it out and back to the video. Let's start with the basics, which is shutter speed, ISO, aperture and exposure compensation. Now, before going any further, if you press and hold, this front dial and hold it for like two seconds, you will get into the shortcut menu for adjusting where all of these buttons are. So if I'm going through them and yours do a different thing, at least on the Fuji cameras, this is a quick way to get to it. So aperture is always on the front dial. It's just the easiest place to get to. It's the most common sense place for it to remain, especially if I'm holding the camera like this. In terms of the uh, exposure compensation, obviously the compensation dial here is very useful. I do sometimes put it into C, which is custom, and then that reprograms the exposure compensation to the front dial. So the front dial is, if I obviously turn it like that, it's exposure compensation then. If I push it in once, it then becomes my shutter speed. And then I will use that to adjust the shutter speed. The rear dial is the ISO. And finally, the, the actual dials at the top I generally use them if it's very cold and I've got thick gloves on, or if I want to really slow down with my photography, or if I can't use the screen or the viewfinder for whatever reason, I want to remain extra discreet, then these come very, very handy. Moving on to the drive settings, which is a little bit just down there, I have it set to continuous low, which is effectively burst mode, but a slow burst mode of around eight frames a second. This allows me to take a single photo if I want, or if I keep holding the shutter, it will take a burst. The reason I use that is because sometimes if things are happening, I would rather have 10 photos where I can later pick the best one rather than just go for one image and hope it have everything sort of like lines up and I get the right moment. As for the shutter button, I have made a few changes. So I do combine traditional focusing with the shutter as well as back button focus, but then I will explain this in more detail later in the video. Finally, let's have a quick look at the custom buttons. Now this is quite specific to the X-T4. The X-T3 will be very similar as well. Um, so yeah, if you have another camera, you might want to skip this bit, but do watch it actually because at least the reasoning for why I've set it up like this can carry over to whatever camera that you use. So anyway, on the X-T4 or the X-T3, I think I can one as well, but anyway, you can press and hold the display back button and that will get you into the shortcut for the custom button. So you can set them up quickly and see what's already assigned to. Let's start first with the top one. There's a, a function button right at the top next to the shutter button. And I have that set to electronic shutter, which is effectively a quiet silent shutter. The reason it's there is because it's very intuitive being next to the shutter, but also every time I wanted a silent shutter, I wanted it very quickly. So by having instant access meant I could get it into the quieter setting very quickly. Moving down, we have AF on, which is effectively back button focus. And that is set to default, which is to focus, but we'll talk about that later. As for the rear dial, if you push that in, I've got that still on the default, which is a digital punch in zoom um, when you're in manual focus to help you with focusing. But again, we'll talk about that later. 
Q menu, now this is this Q menu is quite specific to the X-T4, but basically I've got the self-timer, I've got the autofocus custom settings, which I just leave at default and never ever change them because the default ones are fine. Um, and then I've got screen brightness and the film simulations. The film simulations, even though I shoot everything in RAW, it is a nice way to kind of put a little filter over the screen just to give me an idea of what the end result will be like. So if I'm shooting in black and white, for black and white, I can then put a film simulation over it, and even though the RAW file will retain all of its color, at least I can compose in black and white, which will help me. Anyway, moving down to AEL, um, this I've reprogrammed to my focus type, so single point, zone, or all, and the reason it's there is because it's the closest one to the joystick, so it just makes sense. Finally, the top um, D-pad button is the face detect on and off. Now, this is more for a video portrait, but for some street scenarios like street portraits, this can be very useful to quickly acquire focus on the person's face. Oh, and one more is this side button, the left one. I've got that set to photometry settings. So if you are in aperture priority or shutter priority, you can obviously tell the camera how to sort of uh, expose if you like. Um, but I do have that set to multi most of the time, but again I'll explain that later. In terms of all of the other buttons and things, they're all set either to off, so I don't press them by accident, or they are video specific features because obviously it's a hybrid camera. And generally speaking, that is all of the settings specifically for street photography and just general photography. <laughs> In total, I have three different focusing methods, and whichever one I use depends on the conditions, subjects, and things like that. So the first one is what I would use for 90% of the time. It's my go-to street photography setting, and it goes as follows. So first of all, the focus type is set to AFC, which is continuous autofocus. What that means is that if I acquire focus on a subject, if I move or the subject moves, the camera will try and track and adjust for the change in distance. So so in the street environment, if you've seen any of my POV videos, I walk around a lot. I very rarely stop, you know, compose and things like that. I'm not saying it's good or bad, it's just my approach. So having it in AFC allows me to remove that sort of error, if you like, if I focus and then I move or the subject moves. In terms of the actual shutter button, I still have the focusing assigned and the auto exposure assigned to the half press of the shutter. So the reason for that is because sometimes I'll keep my camera a bit lower down, which means I can hold the camera like this and just focus with my thumb without having to reach around the back of the camera. It just makes life a lot easier. And also for street photography, I don't really take my time a huge amount. So having it there just saves a bit of time. Finally, in terms of the actual focusing method on the camera, I use the feature called zone focus which effectively gives you a small box or so let's say quite a large box with very small boxes in it and what it does is whatever that box is the camera will try and find something to focus inside so it's if you like it's half manual not manual traditionally like you still tell the camera focus here but within that area it's up to you where you focus typically i will leave that in the middle and then I can just move my camera and recompose or compose as needed. Now, this is definitely not the most accurate way to focus and the hit rate definitely drops. I would say probably 90%, maybe a bit less of my photos are in focus with regards to what I want it to be in focus. But what I have found is that 90% is good enough considering how quickly and effortlessly it is for me to focus, I don't even think about it. So the extra drop in, uh, let's say, reliability is more than made up for by the fact that I don't have to actively think about focusing and let the camera do it. The second method utilizes a back button focus, and this method I typically use for a slower scene. So let's say, for example, I wanna take a cityscape. Let's say, for example, I wanna take a photo of like things which are still, and generally a very slower pace of photography. For this, I'll put the camera into um, AFS, which is the sing um, single autofocus. By that, I mean that if you acquire focus, the camera will not try to then adjust for that focus. So once you've acquired it, that's it, okay? And for this, I do use back button focus. So I have disconnected the um, shutter button from focusing 
Now the shutter button still does the auto exposure, but what I have found in my experience is every time I use this focus method, 99.9% .9 of the time I'm in manual focus anyway because I just generally take more time. So to me, that is not really that important. So in terms of what's um, on the screen, I have the small square, so the single point autofocus, and that is obviously a lot more accurate than the zone. And as I've said, I would use this for things like cityscapes, still life. You know, if I'm walking down a harbour and I see a boat, I will use this method. Um, typically, I won't use it for street photography, people, busy scenes, for just quieter locations. And yet, in my experience, it's definitely a lot more accurate than the previous method. And the reason I use the back button focus is because what I can do is, let's say I'm walking through a port and there's a nice boat in the distance, I can focus on that boat with the back button. I can then let go and I will know that as long as I don't move around too much in terms of forwards and backwards, that boat will remain in good focus. Then I can worry about composing and taking photos without worrying about um, the camera refocusing. Another example is, let's say I'm walking, I wanna focus on the background. So let's say it's the shard in the background and I wanna get people walking through which are out of focus. Now, if I use the previous method, the camera will always try and refocus on whatever it thinks should be in focus. Whereas this way, I will focus on the shard and then let go of the focusing and just keep taking photos until I get the right type of people going through the shot and get the composition that I want without worrying about the camera trying to always acquire focus. The last method is definitely my least used one and I can probably count on one hand how often I've done it and that's traditional manual focusing. Typically this is reserved for things which are in heavy, heavy fog and the autofocus is struggling as well as things which are like hundreds of miles away, like a mountain that's million miles away and um, a bit hazy, then obviously the autofocus might not be the best in that condition. So manual focus comes in very useful. Obviously this is a very, very slow process. I will not use it for street photography and I will use it in just these, let's say, not extreme scenarios, but scenarios where the autofocus would typically struggle. And to do that, I use the punch in zoom on, on, on here, the rear dial, to digitally zoom in. I will then adjust the focus until it looks good to my eye. And that's it, and take a photo. Now let's move on to exposure. So first of all, I want to start with manual exposure. And the reason for that is, in my opinion, once you understand how to manually expose the camera, when you later start using the auto exposure settings, such as aperture priority, you will actually be able to utilize those modes much better because you will understand what the camera is trying to do and why. So before going into my whys, let me first tell you how I set up the camera in terms of just the settings. And then as I've said, we will go into why I set it up in such a way. Let's start with ISO and my go-to setting for a typical city walk is 500. When I say typical city walk, what I mean by that is that the light can always change. So you can walk from a bright sunny spot into some shade, into a building, into a market, or into like by the river where there's light reflecting off the water and everything is really bright. So if the light's changing, I always start with ISO 500. In terms of a constant light, then I will obviously reduce the ISO and keep it lower depending on what's needed. So if I'm in a park or if it's a very gray day and generally the light is not changing, then I will keep the ISO as low as needed. In terms of the highest ISO setting, I typically only go up to 6400. I find 6400, at least on the Fujifilm cameras, is about the maximum where I am happy with the noise, Any anything above that is too noisy. But generally in my experience, I found that I never go above 3200, but then I don't really shoot at night either. As for aperture, I typically have it between F2 and F8. F4 is my constant starting point, and then I will adjust if needed later. Sometimes I will stretch up to F11, maybe a little bit higher, but that's very, very rare, and typically only when I want as much in focus as possible, but more often than not, it's because there's so much light that I wanna try and block some of it out. When it comes to setting the shutter speed, typically I will just set it depending on what's needed to achieve the correct exposure. So what I mean by that is the ISO is set to 500, 
aperture is set to f4 and then the shutter speed has just whatever it has to be for good exposure or correct exposure so to speak now in terms of my limits for shutter speed i typically don't go below 1 over 250 and once i get to around 1 over 4000 i will find another way to control the light coming in to bring that shutter speed down and the reason for that is because I want to have headroom on either side. Now, if it's a real like emergency, I will drop down to one over 200 for shutter speed, but any lower than that, I would just rather raise the ISO because in my opinion, I would rather have a slightly noisy image then an image with a little bit of motion blur. Now, in terms of target exposure, everyone has their own way of working. And also with me, depending on the end result, I will expose slightly differently. So for example, if it's a bright sunny day and I want to get an even exposure so that everything looks good, I will underexpose by 0.3 or sometimes 0.6. On the other hand, if I want to get the highlights perfectly exposed and then the shadows to fall to black, especially at like midday, then I can underexpose by like minus two sometimes. Now, on the other hand, if it's like a gray rainy day, I'll keep the exposure around zero. Um, and if it's a snowy day, sometimes I'll even overexpose by 0.3 because the camera sometimes naturally underexposes snow because obviously snow is meant to be white, but the camera doesn't know that. So generally speaking, that's where I have it. And then in terms of like sunrise, sunset, blue hour, I'll keep it around zero as well and then just adjust it as needed. Obviously, if I'm pointing the camera into the sun, I will have to underexpose. If I'm pointing it, let's say, into the shade, then I'll have to overexpose. So I do play around, but around zero is about right. Now let's talk about why. Specifically, why do I shoot in manual and why do I use these particular settings? So manual, I will typically use if I want to just focus on my photography. I am not making videos. I am just zoned out taking photos. And also if I want to work on my craft and just get better. It helps me just really sort of focus on what I'm doing and it's, yeah, to me, it's just the most enjoyable way of taking photos. Funny enough, when I look through all of my previous photos, most of my favorite and best and most popular photos have all been taken in manual. Now, as for settings, let's quickly start with aperture because it's the easiest to explain. So F2, I will typically use that if I want the softest possible image or if I want a bit of the foreground or the background to be out of focus. F8, on the other hand, I will use that if I want to ensure that more of the image is in focus and if I want to have the sharpest possible result because obviously the lens does work better at around F8. F11, as I've said, I will only go up to that if I want to just block out more light. In terms of which one I use and when, typically, if there's like very, very nice light and I know I want it soft, I will go to F2. Um, but generally speaking, I don't have a particular rule for what to use when. Um, I will just see how I feel and go from there, which is why I have the lens in F4 for most of the time, because it's a happy medium. And going through like a typical day, not very often I will deviate from F4, um, maybe F2 sometimes, but generally I will stick around the middle of that range. In terms of the shutter speed, um, I didn't mention this earlier actually, but I want to keep it as close to 1 over 500 as possible, with obviously 1 over 250 being my minimum. Now, the main reason for it is because 1 over 500 almost guarantees that everything within reason will be motion free. And especially if you've seen my style of like photography, it's very erratic. I just walk around. I sometimes don't even stop to take a photo. So to me, having this higher shutter speed just means that any likelihood of something having a bit of motion blur or whatever is just reduced. Now, I would always rather increase the ISO than drop the shutter speed, but that's we'll talk about that in a minute. And as I've said, I typically don't go above one over 4,000 um, because I always want to have a bit of safety room if I need it. And I know some people would say, well, just reduce the shutter speed and stay still. And that's all well and good. If I'm doing a cityscape, if I'm standing still, I would reduce the shutter speed, which means I can also reduce the ISO. Um, but for a walking, city walking for street photography environment, I would always rather have a higher shutter speed. And finally, the ISO. To put simply, the reason I keep ISO 500 is to allow for the higher shutter speed. So even if I go into a darker area, and I need to reduce the shutter speed or open up the aperture, I will still maintain a high enough shutter speed to make sure that whatever I take a photo of is as motion free as possible. Now, to summarize everything, if you're still a bit un unsure or confused, 
The whole point of this system, of this workflow, is that whatever the lighting condition is within reason, I have plus or minus one stop of adjustment, of exposure adjustment, either on the aperture, on the shutter speed, and on the ISO, while still maintaining the right settings for that environment. So if I walk quickly run into a darker area, I can quickly drop the shutter speed, and I will still have the right exposure and still maintain a good enough shutter speed. In the same way, I can quickly open up the aperture or I can quickly drop or increase the ISO. The whole point of this is that I can pick any of the three adjustments either way to get the correct exposure if something changes very, very quickly. And that's the point of it. it has, it's all about being quick and being able to adjust to the lighting conditions very quickly. Now, obviously, this doesn't substitute being proactive, as in if you know you're going to spend the next 30 minutes in a market that's you know dark, then adjust for that before you go in. This is mainly for a very rapidly changing scene, like a typical city walk. Now, I know that some of you might be sitting at home wondering, hold on a minute, we've always been told to keep ISO as low as possible. Now, you're telling us to keep it higher than needed. Why is that? So I will get into that in a separate video. Okay, but for the purpose of this video, I just want you to understand that you will not tell the difference between ISO 160, ISO 320, 500, or even 1000 to that degree. Unless you're like underexposing your photos by 10 stops and trying to bring it up later, or unless you're zooming into a thousand percent, you will not tell any real difference on a modern camera. But as I've said, I'll save this for a separate video because I think it's a can of worms in itself. Now let's move on to auto exposure. So typically I'll use auto exposure. What I mean by that, sorry, is aperture priority, okay? where well, you tell the camera I want it on F4 and the camera does your ISO and your shutter speed for you and obviously adjust the exposure depending where you point the camera. So typically I would use this if photography is not my only priority when I'm out. So let's say I'm filming one of my POV videos. I will always have it on aperture priority because obviously my attention is divided between photos and video. In the same way, if I'm out with friends and family on holiday, I don't want to be the one that like always messing around with settings, trying to take my time and get the right image. I'll just leave it on auto, and then if I get a good photo, I get a good photo. So any time where I want to just hand off some of the responsibility to the camera, but even so, right, if you're, let's say, in a really busy market and there's loads of things going on and you're trying to just get a good shot, then this mode will probably be better than manual as well because you literally all your like attention is going on to getting the right moment rather than what setting to be in. So it does have its benefits um, even if you're like 100% focused on photography. Now, although there are different types of um, auto exposure, so for example, you can have aperture priority, shutter priority, things like that. I will typically leave it an aperture priority because aperture, in my opinion, is what has the biggest impact in terms of like how your image looks. So if you want things, you know, in focus or out of focus with regards to background to foreground relationship. So I will leave it there. Also, because on this camera, aperture is there, out of all other adjustments, it's the quickest one that I can adjust. So if, for example, I go into a really bright scene and I can see that the camera is struggling to control the light that's coming in, I can very quickly just close this and help the camera out. And this goes back to my point earlier when I said that actually being, like, being proficient in manual exposure will help you with auto exposure. This is what I mean. So yeah, aperture priority is the one I pick. Before going any further, we do need to tell the camera within what parameters to work when it comes to setting your ISO and shutter speed. Now, to do that, you go into the settings, and when you're in the settings, you go to the camera um, shooting settings, and then you go all the way down to a setting called ISO auto setting. If you're using a different uh, brand of camera, you will you must have this, just it might be called differently. You then go into auto one, and I've got it set default uh, sensitivity is 160 so basically the camera will always try to keep the iso as low as possible the max sensitivity is 6400 which is obviously how far the camera will go and then the minimum shutter speed is 1 over 250 as i've said that's my lowest shutter speed now you can adjust auto 2 and auto 3 for different settings so for example auto 2 you can have a lower shutter speed and you might use that at night but typically i don't so i just have auto 1 set so basically what this means is whenever you're taking photos, you've 
the camera will adjust within your constraints. So you will always have a shutter speed of 250 or above, and then it will always prioritize increasing the ISO to 6400 versus reducing that shutter speed. Now let's talk about the photometry settings. And as we've discussed before, we've assigned it to this button here. So there are four in total, right? You've got multi, center weighted, spot, and average. I'll be honest with you, multi is the one that I use probably 100% of the time. Because multi, it literally takes the entire scene and it um, sets the exposure based on the whole scene. You can then use the exposure compensation to adjust it if you want. But generally speaking, if I'm an auto, that is what I would use. If I want to use any of the other ones like center weighted or spot, I would rather just be in manual because it, it gives me more control but um, multi overall I found to be the most accurate for me. And generally that is pretty much everything when it comes to my street photography settings. If you have any questions, comments, please write them down below. If there's something that you think I've missed out, please also write it down, I'll try and get back to you. Um, and generally that, that is all. Um, if the light behind me has been going in and out, it's because the sun's been going in and out and I've been putting, filming this for long enough now. So that's it. It has been a bit long-winded, so if you're still here, I do thank you. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. Have a fantastic day. If you like the video, give it a like. If you're not subscribed, please do consider subscribing for more photography-related content in the future. And yeah, have a great day, and see you soon. Bye.